Media Live. Good evening. Welcome to yet another episode of uh, Walk In Series, where we discuss practical clinical situations with uh, presentation and expert discussion. Today we have uh, a theme on child with poor vision, squint, and nystagmus: how to diagnose and manage, and when to refer. Just before we go on to the webinar itself, I just want to remind all the viewers that we have a brand new One AIOS YouTube channel on which you can have the entire content of AIOS at uh, one particular location. This will include content from scientific committee, ARC, etc., and also from the webinars that we have conducted in the past. In this uh, uh, YouTube channel, we have already about 1,400 videos uh, lined up for you to watch whenever you want. Today's webinar will be chaired by our president, Dr. Harban Lal, and uh, Professor Pradeep Sharma, who is the former professor of Harpy Center Ames and currently director of pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus, and neuroophthalmology, Center for Sight, New Delhi. Moderators are Dr. Manoj Mathur, who is the honorary treasurer of EIOS, and uh, effectively, it will be moderated by Dr. Savleen Kaur, who is the assistant professor, advanced eye center, PGI Chandigarh. Our uh, expert panel consists of Dr. K. S. Santan Gopal, who is the past president of AIOS and also an experienced epistemologist, works in Bangalore. Professor Pramod Kumar Pandey, honorary secretary of SPOSI and former director of GNEC, Molanazad Medical College, New Delhi. And president elect of SPOSI, Dr. Shubhangi Bhave, who is a consultant ophthalmologist and a pediatric ophthalmology specialist at Drishti Eye Clinic, Nagpur. We also have Dr. Elizabeth Joseph, who is Chief of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, Little Flower Hospital, Angamali, Kerala, and Professor Dr. Rohit Saxena from RP Center, New Delhi. Our speakers are very talented and diverse. Dr. Ramesh Kikunaya begins with a talk on infant with poor visual response. He's the director of Child Eye Institute, Elvi Prasada Institute, Hyderabad. He'll be followed by Dr. Ankita Bisani, uh, who's the Chief of Pediatric Ophthalmology, Arvind Eye Hospital, Chennai. She speaks on a child with isotropia. Sumita Agarkar, who's the Deputy Director of Shankaranitralaya, Chennai, and Chief of Pediatric Ophthalmology, speaks on a child with exotropia. She'll be followed by Dr. Jitendra Jethani, who's the Director of Baroda Children's Eye Care and Squint Clinic, Baroda. He speaks on a child with congenital nystagmus. And Professor Pradeep Sharma speaks on a child with progressive myopia. Dr. Subhash Dadia, Professor of Ophthalmology of GNEC, New Delhi, Molanazad Medical College, speaks on a child with amblyopia. I hand you over to Dr. Saulin Kaur for the proceedings. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandosh. A very good evening to all of you. Today, we have an excellent webinar organized by AIOS to uh, evaluate, diagnose, treat a child who has poor vision, squint, and nystagmus and when to refer these children. With an excellent lineup of speakers, uh, we start off today's webinar with Dr. Ramesh Kikunaya, if I can request him to share his screen. He would be speaking on an infant who has a poor visual response. Thank you so much, uh, Savlin, and uh, thank you, Dr. Santosh and the AOS team. I'll be talking about the infant with poor vision, why my baby can't see, what, why, and how. Uh, basically, most of the infants has to be referred to a specialist. There are some situations probably, depending upon the expertise of the person, uh, can be managed. So infant visual assessment is a little bit different from pediatric, that means, uh, you know, toddler and juvenile uh, children's vision assessment. Just a very little of milestones we should know what happens at birth, what happens at two to three months of age as the child recognizes the mother. And then three to four months is a good uh, time where the child starts fixing and following light. And then six months, the child tries to explore when the child has neck holding. So these are some of the very, very important. There are much more details to it, but we need to know. But children and infants, sometimes older children, they come with a dip different package. 
you will have to examine in different situations. You might have to uh, go out of your routine examination technique to get at least a glimpse of some of the visual response of the child. As in this case, you might have to completely darken the room and then you can see the fixation is not very steady and you can elicit in the dark room when you throw a light, you can see nystagmus coming. So this is subtle signs that what you're dealing with some of these patients. Don't expect you know, to look into the details of spontaneous venous pulsation and things like that, it's difficult. Some of the techniques where you can use uh, for the fundus photography, but sometimes you just have a glance, whether with that you have to say whether there is a pseudo edema or a true disc edema. So situation is like this, you know, this infant, I'm going to show some case you know, the child is nine months old, still neck holding is not there. Because when you assess a child with uh, infant with uh, any kind of eye problem, you are not looking just at the vision. You are looking at uh, eye immortality. You are looking at general health. You are looking at developmental milestone. You are also looking at the response. What is happening? Child is comfortable with the mother's lap, but you can see the sporadic fixation. There are some subtle developmental milestones like social smile is there. In spite of nine or 10 months, there is no neck holding. Similar situation here. The child is a little bit older. I'm showing because uh, it's not that infant is the only thing we'll be seeing, but there will be a combination of things. That's why you need to know a little bit older children, what are the response. Trying to see with so much damage in the brain, because this damage has happened prenatally, not postnatally. That's why the child is okay. So the differential diagnosis of poor vision in babies we'll discuss. And one of the most important cause for poor vision in first is cerebral visual impairment. And I'll just touch upon how to approach the diagnosis. So clues for abnormal vision, even if you uh, don't know anything, lack of fixation behavior, searching eye movements, nystagmus and strabismus tells there is a poor visual maturation in an infant. With this Picture with one glance, you know, the child on the left side has a very good visual response. You don't have to do a telerecuity chart. You don't have to do anything. But if you look at the video on the right side, there is no fixation at all. But if you look carefully with the torchlight, there is a cataract there with nystagmus, with searching eye movements. So picking up this normal and abnormal visual behavior in a bilaterally blind patient is a bit easy. Uh, you have to have some kind of bright uh, toys or some light or some kind of uh, you know, fixation target is what you need to have to assess the vision in an infant. I'm again talking about diagnostic point of view, what you need. Refractive error can be very high and low in these kids, but again, the, the response will be very poor. One of the important thing as an ophthalmologist or eye care professionals we need to have is the ability to do a Bruckner's reflex or a red reflex. That tells a lot about most of these kids because as an ophthalmologist, if we can rule out in the first examination most of the anterior segment diseases uh, and also posterior segment diseases, you can come to a fairly uh, narrow differential diagnosis. Again, look at this patient with high hypermetropia. Visual behavior looks very good. What I'm holding, I'm holding a very small toy, which is very attractive. And that itself is enough, probably, you might have to use your thumb as an occluder to see whether there is any preference. Again, we have enough other tests like telerecuity, Leah paddles and things like that, but 
this should be more than enough. Look at this child. Uh, you can definitely see this both eyes total cataract there with very, very poor visual response. And the lower video uh, is after the cataract surgery. You know, still there is an abnormal head posture. Even with that, the child is able to see. I'm showing these videos uh, just to show how you can pick up these things. So anterior and posterior segment anomalies, which are listed here, I think it's pretty easy to pick up with the comprehensive examination of the anterior segment and also the posterior segment. And always remember in an infant vision assessment and the strabismus or eye movement assessment goes hand in hand. It's not like, okay, I've done the vision assessment, let me do a strabismus or let me do a nystagmus evaluation. Everything goes at one go. So some of the differential diagnosis like congenital stationary night blindness, it does not happen completely in infant, but we can get some of the patients. Decreased vision in dim elevation. Uh, the child is very uncomfortable. They will have nystagmus and myopia will be there. Labor's congenital amaurosis is one of the very commonly referred uh, patients with infants with poor vision. They have this typical ocular digital sign. They don't have nystagmus. They have nystagmoid movement and they have an inophthalmos and they have a poor vision. Most of the times what happens is they get two or three MRIs before they come to an ophthalmologist. Mainly, it's not a cerebral visual impairment. It's an ocular visual impairment because of the retinal dystrophy. Albinism, again, that's why I said vision assessment, eye movement assessment, and strabismus assessment. All three in one, you can do it in this inference. And obviously, remember to check the, the external appearance look for any dysmorphism. Everything happens in one glance in children. Excuse me. So uh, after the comprehensive evaluation, you will know whether there is a coloboma, whether there is a morning glory syndrome, all that is possible. And sometimes everything will be normal and the child will have just a delayed maturation. Anterior segment normal, no strabismus, no nystagmus, posterior segment is normal, no refractive error, high refractive error, then probably you are dealing with a case of delayed visual maturation. This is again a nine-month-old uh, infant with microcephaly, low birth weight, seizures, visual inattention, no nystagmus, mild temporal pallor, normal lattice segment and the pupils. And on the scan, you can see in the occipital area, there is an infarct. This is hypoxic ischemic ankylopathy or uh, PVL or uh, call it as mostly a cerebral visual impairment and um, sometimes cortical visual impairment. But the correct terminology is cerebral visual impairment. This way, you have ruled out all the ocular causes and mainly it's posterior segment. Again, the clue is, if some children come to you with normal development, infant with good tone of the muscle, you know, looking here and there, but except there is a poor visual response, mostly it is LCA. But if they have eventful birth like hypoxia, seizures, microcephaly, global development delay with ocular, you know, vision development delay, it's mostly a cerebral visual impairment. You will get, if you do the MRI scan of these patients, they will have hardly some tissue brain available uh, depending upon the severity of this CVI. I'm just going to show some of the images because these are all the possible uh, things what you see in cerebral visual impairment. Disturbance of vision caused by defective function of retrochasmatic part of visual system in the absence of important ocular disease. Again, I will not go into the details of CVI 
this is a dull talk, but you should know what is ventral and what is dorsal. Where is the problem in the dorsal as well as in the ventral? And also, what are the top causes for this uh, problem in children? Most of them are caused by perinatal hypoxia. Seizures, cerebral palsy, and microcephaly is the most common associated problems they have. And they can also have varied esotopia and exotopia. Visual rehabilitation, child uh, rehabilitation is the most important. It has to be multi-systemic, not one way. You have to do a lot of behavioral characteristic changes in ch uh, children with this. And you need to work them uh, probably for many years to get the good uh, uh, development in that. So last three slides, which is telling, this is directly taken from Mike Brodsky's textbook on pediatric neuroophthalmology, apparently blind infant. Just check whether there is infantile nystagmus or no. If there is nystagmus, think about anterior visual pathway disease, either optic nerve or retina. These are the two things you can have. Uh, you can also get uh, uh, other tests like uh, MRI, ERG, which will really help which way you are going. History, examination, looking for infantile nystagmus, mostly it is anterior visual pathway. If there is no nystagmus, good vestibular uh, ocular reflexes, which is normal, uh, there is prematurity, then you are thinking mostly about the cerebral visual impairment in these patients. Having said that, some of the CVI patients also can have nystagmus. So this is the uh, flow chart showing how do you differentiate apparently blind? I'm sure uh, showing this flow chart because the anterior segment and the posterior segment is normal, except in the last uh, few cases, it can be abnormal. Even LCA in an infant can have a normal fundus. So, so these are some of the investigations you can do immediately to get the answer for a poor visual response in an infant. That's why because of this multi-system involvement, most of this infants has to be referred to a pediatric ophthalmologist in uh, 90 to 95 percent of the cases because some of the things like CVI and all that is an ophthalmic emergency where you can start a rehabilitation process. So in conclusion, Suspected poor vision in infant is a challenging situation. Remember the pointers to poor vision. I would again reiterate meticulous histories as important as examination to look for specific etiological uh, clues. And of course, once you diagnose, and sometimes even to diagnose, a team approach is very, very important. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramesh. That was indeed an exhaustive review of uh, how to approach a child who has low vision. You gave us uh, some important pointers as how an exhaustive history and examination can be done before, even if we do not have any sophisticated and relatively expensive test to check the visual acuity, a detailed history, and of course, and systemic as well as an ocular examination can actually help us come to some conclusion as to this child has poor vision. While Dr. Ankita uh, loads her presentation, if I can have one comment or anything that our chairpersons or the panel likes to add on. I think Dr. it Ankita. is a wonderful talk by Dr. Ramesh. Uh, I would just like to add that uh, we, uh, we may, uh, nowadays we have that CVI manual, which is very uh, diligently uh, produced by Dr. Niranjan uh, Pahere. I think we should make use of that. It gives us detailed things about the CVI management. So it's a really difficult task and most places may not have that facility. But yes, we need to see that these cases are sent to the right place. 
Thank you, sir. Dr. Ankita would now be speaking on how to approach a child with esotropia. So, with a very uh, wonderful start, uh, I will start with my topic, which is a child with esotropia and uh, walk in, in walk in patient series. Not able to go to the next slide. Okay, just click, just on, the click on the screen. Just click yes, on the screen. yes, yes. So I have financial disclosures. The objective of my presentation is to understand the main categories of esotropia, a practical approach to patient presenting with esotropia, to categorize urgent and non-urgent reference for esotropia, and to discuss the treatment options for a practicing ophthalmologist. So whenever a walk-in uh, patient with esotropia is encountered, multiple questions occur in the minds of a practicing ophthalmologist. Instead, a simple approach with history taking, examination, investigation, and treatment would clinch to a diagnosis and uh, begin at least initial management. So here is a child who presented, a five-year-old child who presented, sorry, who presented to us uh, uh, with, uh, well, who was referred to us with esotropia. But the corneal reflex was central in both the eyes and extraocular movements were within normal limits. Is this really isotropia? No, it is actually pseudoisotropia, which is an optical illusion due to facial architecture. No squint noted to corneal reflex. These are commonly encountered with children with small interpupillary distance, wide nasal bridge or larger epicanthal folds and results as the nasal bridge grows. Also, transient isotropia is very normal up to three months of age, as R.K. Sir had pointed out, that fixation usually begins after three months of age. So, uh, as uh, any uh, strabismus, we have to first understand the onset and duration of isotropia. Any perinatal injury also uh, common among isotropia. Family history of isotropia has to be noted. Developmental delay is commonly associated with isotropia, and a fam family album tomography will help us to understand the onset and the progression of isotropia. If there is an acute onset, then of course the other other uh, history like double vision, headache and asthenopia, history of viral in in illness and recent vaccination, head trauma, and excessive near work should also be noted. Uh, uh, on examination, uh, as with any ophthalmic case, visual acuity and cycloplegic refraction has to be done. In some cases, cy stronger cycloplegics may be needed, for example, in esotropia less than five years of age or in later hypotropia. Here's another one-year-old child who was referred to as e with esotropia since six months of age. The child was not fixing and following in right eye with 30 degrees of esotropia. Anterior segment examination shows a congenital cataract. As uh, R.K. Sir has already pointed out, uh, anterior segment examination is very important. Even media obesities like uh, cataract, corneal scars, or other uh, cause of unilateral loss of vision in less than four years of age will usually present with esotropia. Similarly, a posterior segment evaluation is also in important to complete the evaluation. Uh, in a walk-in clinic, we can actually do basic squint evaluation. We can uh, do a head posture. A corneal reflex can uh, easily be done and uh, extraocular movements can be evaluated. Ductions, uh, to emphasize on ductions, this has to be checked. And a doll's eye head maneuver will help for an uncooperative child. Fixation preference can easily be checked in a walk-in clinic and diplopia charting, if a diplopia is present, can also be done. Broadly, isotropias are classified into comitant and in, uh, incomitant uh, isotropias, which has accommodative and a non-accommodative type. Accommodative are usually refractive, non-refractive accommodative, and partially accommodative. In non-accommodative, there are infantile isotropia, non-accommodative ex convergence excess isotropias, and acquired isotropias. So a five-year-old presented to us with uh, 35 prism diopters of isotropia for near and 40 prism diopters for, uh, sorry, 35 for distance and 40 for near. Uncorrected visual acuity was 6 by 60 in right eye and 6 by 36 in left eye. A cycloplegic refraction showed high hyperopia. So this was nothing but an accommodative isotropia. So the characteristic of a refractive accommodative are high hyperopia, usually more than plus four diopters. Distant angle is usually equal to the near angle, a normal AC by E ratio. With full correction, there is little or no uh, residual ET. 
uh, the characteristic of non-refractive accommodative or moderate hyperopia, emetropia or myopia uh, can also be encountered in these cases. Distant angle is usually less than near angle. There is a high AC by ratio and full correction is obtained only with bifocals. So here is a case where with uh, in a refractive accommodative where we just connected with the uh, uh, hyperopic lenses and the isotropia was completely corrected and a non-refractive accommodative where bifocals had corrected the isotropia. To, little, to elaborate a little more on spectacle corrections, any degree of isotropia is there, then a full cycloplegic refraction with full correction should be given. So according to the AAO guidelines, uh, even if the age is uh, less than one year, about uh, uh, 1.5 uh, diopters of hyperopia should be corrected in uh, less than one year of age and above one year of age, even a minimal one plus uh, one diopters of hyperopia should be corrected. Bifocal lenses, usually executive bifocals are used and the bifocal line should bisect the child's pupil. Otherwise, it will not correct the ET. The, the characteristic of an infantile isotropia will be large angle, uh, a cross fixation. So where the child uses the eye to see the, uh, the uh, ipsilateral eye to see the temporal fields of the opposite side and vice versa. Latent nystagmus, dissociated vertical deviation, inferior oblique overaction, a mild or moderate amblyopia, non-significant hyperopia. Usually it is initially managed with spectacles and patching therapy and referred for surgical correction to a pediatric ophthalmologist. Amblyopia management is uh, required, like patching is required in, uh, in uh, any case with preset amblyopia or if there is a fixation preference, alternating eye patching might be advised to patients to prevent fixation preference and thus prevent amblyopia in some cases. Vision therapy are also indicated to improve amblyopia and binocularity. There is always a uh, controversy whether uh, infantile isotropia have to be operated early or late. The advantages of early surgery would be better stereopsis and DSV and reduce post-op DVD. The advantages of late surgery would be better accuracy in estimating the angle of deviation, possibility in correcting vertical misalignment in same sitting and treatment of amblyopia pre-op. Another child, a 10-year-old child presented to us with sudden onset of diplopia. There was a history of prolonged usage of mobile. The visual acuity of 66 unaided and isotropia was committed with full extraocular movements. So this was diagnosed as basic type of acquired non-accommodative isotropias. Acquired non-accommodative isotropias usually present with sudden onset of committed isotropia with diplopia. The commonly encountered type under this subheading would be the basic type which usually occurs in children more than six months of age. Uh, the risk factor could be a prolonged usage of nerve, near device. And if present with neurological symptoms, they have to be uh, neuroimaged. Uh, the divergence insufficiency type usually are presents in older age group. And this can be secondary to quantine tumors or raised ICT. A spasm of near reflex, which is nothing but ciliary spasm, which presents usually with pseudomyopia, can also present with isotropia and uh, related to psychological factors such as stress and anxiety, usually treated with cycloplegics, hyperopic corrections, and counseling. Neuroimaging is very important uh, in any acute onset isotropia to rule out any underlying intracranial disease. The treatment options could be conservative treatment or Botox injections. If nothing works, then surgery is the final outcome. So in any incompetent strabismus, a forced duction test can easily be done. And uh, it can help uh, if it is an uh, unrestricted on abduction, then a diagnosis of six nerve palsy can be made. If it is restricted on abduction, then mechanical restrictive fact, uh, conditions can be thought of, or it could be DRS. There is always a confusion between congenital six nerve palsy and DRS, but uh, congenital six nerve palsy usually presents with very large angles, and uh, there will be no palpable fissure changes, enophthalmos, or shoots, which is commonly encountered in DRS with smaller angles. So to conclude, the treatment options in a walk-in clinic could be non which are non-surgical, could be the refractive error con corrections with monofocals or bifocals, depending on the diagnosis, amblyopia therapy, and further management, it can be referred to a pediatric ophthalmologist. Indications for referral and red flags would be suspected esotropia, where the diagnosis is not sure, any abnormal red reflex, any acute onset esotropia, any esotropia with neurological symptoms, which may need imaging and referral to a neurologist, and isotropia with other ocular abnormalities. So PEARLS would be correction of refractive errors, the first step of management of any strabismus. 
and myopia has to be identified and to be addressed at the earliest. Neuroimaging is very important in any acute onset esotropia. Identifying the type of esotropia is important to plan appropriate management for each case. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ankita. Any questions or comments for Dr. Ankita? Ma'am, you're mute, muted. Um, Uh, we can't hear you, Dr. Elizabeth. These days, we see a lot of uh, acquired and you know non-accommodative esotropia. Dr. Ankita, do you recommend, because uh, we have general ophthalmologists also listening to this presentation, we do take a detailed history of mobile phone use these days. And do you uh, recommend neuroimaging for these cases? Uh, so, Ma'am, actually, usually we don't uh, directly fall to neuroimaging. We can actually, if there is no other uh, neurological symptoms, then uh, it can be observed for some time. Uh, we can try Botox and neuroimaging could be done only in cases where uh, there is some uh, uh, symptoms like uh, headache, nausea, vomiting or something. Then it has to be done. Otherwise, these cases, we generally don't do a neuroimaging. I think Dr. Sumita is now ready with her presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Ankita. We now have a presentation on child with exotropia by Dr. Sumita. She's the deputy director at Pediatric Ophthalmology and Adult Strabismus Services at Shankar Nitralit, Chennai. Welcome, Dr. Sumita. All yours. Thank you uh, to Dr. Santosh, Dr. Savleen, and for AIOS for giving me this opportunity. Uh, am I audible? Because my internet is a bit unstable in the some time okay. back. Loud and clear. Thank you. So, uh, why we need to talk about exotropia? Because it's far more prevalent in Asian countries, including India, compared to exotropia, which is what is re reported in the literature, in Western literature. It appears seemingly straightforward, yet can be dis frustrating to manage. And there are diverse, there is more divergence about divergent squint than anything else in the ophthalmology. And etiology can be very, very diverse and very... Uh, problematic at times and we still have gap in knowledge regarding natural history and best treatment modalities for this. Our uh, failures are probably maximum in this entity than any other strabismus entity as far as surgery is concerned. So to know the enemy exotropia in simple words is defined as an outward deviation of the eyes and uh, if very broadly classified into uh, two uh, groups, committent and incommitent, and my screen shows the way it is uh, classified. And all of these entities can walk uh, even in a child. Some of them you do see more in adults, but uh, any of them can appear in, in your clinic. So just to give an example of each of them, this is a four-year-old child who has a six-month constant squint since birth, six months uh, uh, since six months of age, Visual acuity equal and good in both the eyes, but has craniofacial anomaly along with it. And you can see a large left exotropia clearly seen here and a little bit of a V pattern. Now there is another child who in the, this is the child looking at a distance uh, in the picture on the, uh, here and looking at a near object. And you can see there is a intermittent exotropia this child has, which is more manifested for distance compared to near, means she has good control for near and poor control. This is the most common entity, which we are going to see as far as exotropia is concerned. Then you can have something called a sensory exotropia. This child was brought to the hospital. She is just about nine months old and uh, parents notice the squint. Uh, and of course, when on comprehensive eye examination, he had a cataract in the left eye eye is myopic as well as amblyopic and has cataract. So, so this child's exotropia is purely sensory in nature or secondary to the poor vision. This lady uh, is probably had a squint correction done both eyes, no old records, but has a now large exotropia. You can see telltale signs of surgery on the medial rectus on both eyes. And you can, so this probably will classify as a uh, consecutive exotropia. So this is a nine gaze picture. And as you can see, there is a little limitation and telltale signs of previous surgery here. 
Uh, this is an eight-year-old who has come to me with drooping of eyes and outward deviation, visual acuity again, six by six in both the eyes. And this is his nine gate picture. Again, you can see there is ptosis and there is limitation of movements, a classical uh, congenital third nerve palsy, again, presenting with exotropia, which parents notice. Uh, this again is a 13-year-old who has come to me with squinting of the left eye, limited adduction, a really uh, prominent upshoot here. Uh, exotropia in the primary gaze and of course this uh, this uh, girl has a duan syndrome with exotropia so as you can see another patient who has come to me with exotropia following a surgery for fes uh, surgery for sinus surgery and again large exotropia with limited adduction and mri shows a breach in the medial orbital wall with medial rectus transaction fdt at this point is negative but this also could be what we call as a peritic or a Incompetent exotropia. So, irrespective of what are the types of exotropia, you can have your workup should include, especially in a child, visual acuity uh, with an age appropriate chart. Uh, sensory, some uh, authors put it as like sensory evaluation should be done before you do even a cover test. But if it is not practical, you can do it in any order. Uh, but motor evaluation basically consists of cover test measurements and looking at the motility. No exotropia evaluation is complete without a fundus evaluation as well as cycloplegic refraction. So comprehensive eye checkup is required for any strabismus entity and more so in children with exotropia. So yes, sometimes how to diagnose? Diagnostic, there is no diagnostic dilemma here. It's very clear that she has a very large exotropia, but sometimes as you can see, with this girl here, you can see strabismus is not so evident at this point when we do the cover test, but she has a exophoria. And as we prolong the cover on one eye, you can see a clear drift. And over a period of time, by doing the repeated cover test, you can see now she has broken into an intermittent divergence squint. Now it's a tropia and she's not able to control it anymore because you have artificially, uh, you have by doing a repeated cover test, we have broken her fusional response or we have suspended her fusional response. So this is how sometimes a very uh, typical intermittent exotropia can come. And you can see now she has actually a tropia with uh, uh, straight eyes, which started with phoria and then ended up with tropia. However, there is a small entity here, which is called pseudoexotropia, Admittedly, very rare, but it's an appearance of exotropia because of a very large positive angle kappa. In this picture, if you see, I don't have the cover test pictures of this girl, but as you can see, it appears as if she has left exotropia, but she doesn't because on cover test, she is orthophoric. And it is because of very commonly because of macular ectopia. And you may see in children who have had prematurity or aropio, uh, retinopathy of prematurity leading to a temporal dis, um, displacement of the macula. Now, motor evaluation in these children, that's the most important step. And it is all about assessing control of strabismus and uh, measurements. So control can be assessed subjectively, objectively, and there are some very good um, control scales are also available, which we can look up in the literature. But measurements at least near and distance must be done. If, if it's an intermittent squint, probably recommended to do a far distance one also and side gazes. And especially if you're looking at uh, incompetent squint, probably all important gazes must be measured. So measurements can be uh, what we call as uh, simultaneous prism cover test, which takes care of a manifest exotropia. You go on increasing the prisms while keeping the cover at the same time as prism. And when there is uh, no movement that can be considered as your endpoint or measurement, while as in prism alternate prism cover test, you go on increasing the magnitude. You alternately brace cover and prism, and you go on increasing the prism till you don't get any movement or anything. So this usually gives you total deviation while as simultaneous prism and cover test gives you manifest tropia. Uh, near distance disparity should be checked and this man is responsible for most of our knowledge about 
uh, disparity where if there is if there is a large uh, difference between the angles for near and distance uh, you must follow it up measurements with a monocular patching and if that near distance disparity persists despite patching then you must measure it with a uh, 3d lens uh, three adapter lens plus three adapter lens to see for any high ac by ratio so very short video here uh, as you can see, this lady has a good control. Uh, for She has a fairly poor control for distance, but you are not able to see any squint for the near. So she has a large squint for distance. But the same thing when you check her with a near angle, you can see a very small squint. And what should we do in this case is you patch her for an hour and make sure that other eye is not allowed. There is no binocular stimulation in between when you are opening the patch. And as you can see, her angles have built up to almost same as what you were measuring and the same thing. So this takes care of most of your near distance disparity. This is the easy test. And before planning, if you do get a large difference between the near and distance angle must be done. Uh, so what do you, how do you deal with these children? So correction of refractive error is a very important step. Clearance of media opacities, if there is any. Uh, observation, you can observe small angle, well-controlled ideas. There is no need to jump into surgery or an intervention if it's a control is very good. Sometimes you can give an alternate occlusion, although in children, cooperation is a little uh, issue, but you can, it does help in improving the control. Sometimes over minus glasses are given, although there is a large study in the recent, uh, recently have proved that over minus therapy can sometimes lead to a myopia. Uh, so a little bit cautious in younger children with over minus glasses and orthoptic exercises, of course, can be uh, prescribed in slightly older children and in young adults and prisms as a temporizing method. So as you can see, this child who has had dialect, this is a surgery post-surgery uh, you can see the his exotropy also looks better with the glasses and once the uh, lens has been, intraocular lens has been put. Uh, now, fusional exercises, again, they improve your diplopia awareness as well as in, uh, they train your fusional mechanisms to do better, to control your strabismus. Basically, you are trying, you are training your own muscles. Not very effective in children. In my experience, it doesn't work very well in young children and I don't give it. But in older children and adults, young adults sometimes can be used. Uh, as I said, over minus glasses up to one to two adapter can be prescribed. Uh, usually symmetrically should be given symmetrically. Very useful in younger children if they have poor control. But watch out for esotropia or worse esotropia because that can lead to amblyopia. And as I said, mentioned earlier, a small possibility. Uh, small angle strabismus prisms can be tried. Both ground in and ground in prisms as well as Fresnel. They give relief from diplopia, but again, more or less a temporary method in large angle squints. Now, surgical intervention, if you see a poor control or squinting more than 50% of the waking hours or constant squint, uh, these are the my indications for planning surgery. Um, and of course, if the patients ask for it and parents do often uh, take that decision for us in several issues. So all of these are your indications for surgery. So you have to worry about target angles, timing, and choice of procedure. So if it is well-controlled ideas, better to defer surgery in very young children till you have reliable measurements. Otherwise, between three to seven years is a good age to operate if exotropia is not well-controlled or larger in magnitude. Target angles in patients who are fusers and who have good binocular potential, five to 10 prisms of overcorrection is desirable. However, beware of overcorrection in very young children because sometimes this overcorrection, which is more than 5 to 10 prisms with a poor binocular function, can lead to these children becoming uh, not only monofixators but also amblyops. In adults, it's better to stick to orthophoria as your end target. And in myopic children, sometimes it's better to plan, better to really uh, your, uh, modify your surgery a little towards undercorrection in high myopes. Again, there is a whole lot of uh, controversy about unilateral versus bilateral surgeries, and but it may be also influenced by the type of exotropia. If it's a basic exotropia where near and distance are same, RNR works equally well as a bilateral lateral rectus recession. Uh, 
near distance disparity may also play an important role if your near angles are a little more than distance you would like to do a medial rectus recession rather than doing a bilateral surgery and pattern deviation must be addressed in your surgical plan so uh, this child again with a slight amount of uh, constant right exotropia she also has a little bit of craniosynostosis and a little facial asymmetry as you can see and here uh, I went ahead with do, doing only a right and R and R surgery in the right eye. And as you can see, you got a good alignment. The child which I showed earlier with a large constant exotropia with a V pattern, uh, I even she had equal vision and no, 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 not really a very um, fixation preference. So, and I wanted to correct the V pattern. So I went ahead in this patient with a bilateral lateral lectus recession with the inferior oblique weakening. Uh, with a fairly good alignment post-op. Uh, this child has third year nerve palsy, as I had shown in that earlier picture. And as you can see, he, even though he has uh, adduction limitation here, but he is able to adduct from this to up to almost up to midline. He is able to adduct a little beyond midline. So in this, I went ahead with a little over uh, a large R and R in the right eye. And as you can see, it has given a fairly good cosmetic correction, not a very great uh, improvement in the depression or uh, elevation, but adduction looks a little bit better. Uh, this child again had a V pattern and large exotropia. So since I wanted to correct a V pattern here, I went ahead with bilateral lateral ectus recession and I also tackled obliques in the same plan time. And as you can see, at least on the day one, he looks good. Uh, this is the my girl with Duane syndrome. She had a very large upshoot and relatively small angle exotropia. And I did only a lateral lectus recession with a Y split. And you can see her upshoot looks better here. Uh, still has a small residual exotropia, but overall um, fairly, uh, fairly satisfactory uh, outcome. Uh, now, I'm talking about overcorrection because this was supposed to be a child uh, exotropia with a uh, child with exotropia. Now, Over overcorrection in adults, yeah, just last two slides. The so overcorrection in uh, children is a little dangerous because you can uh, put them at risk of amblyopia and lazy eye. So, if it does happen, watch it very closely. Uh, make sure that uh, better eye is non -prefer uh, preferred eye is occluded. There is, if there is any hypropic correction which you have left uncorrected, correct it and prisms and probably do a little bit, have a little less um, tolerance for surgery and do it a little early. Uh, in, so when to refer or worry or investigate in a child with exotropia, if any exotropia which is associated with unexplained poor vision, you must worry. Look at optic nerve carefully, look at CVI uh, carefully. Any exotropia associated with acquired motility limitation also need to need worry and investigation. Post-trauma, post-surgery, any exotropia which is acquired in these situations also need a little bit of referral and multidisciplinary approach. So this is a 35-year-old. This is my last slide. 35-year-old complains of redness. He has come to redness uh, and no other complaint about diplopia, only on guided questions he's asking, saying diplopia. And he has a very small exotropia in the right eye, but vision is 618 in the right eye and 6 by 6 and 6. He has no complaints about vision. There is a mild restriction of elevation, but rest is full. Uh, on careful examination, there is a trace RAPD. Now, he tells me that he has he has had an uh, evaluation for a military service and at that time his vision was 6 by 6. So we so that's how we ended up with doing an MRI in this patient and you there was a... Uh, circumscribed oval lesion extending up to the cavernous sinus and nerve sheet tumor, suspected nerve sheet tumor, disappeared for follow-up, never came back for follow-up. Uh, did come for allergic conjunctivitis in the emergency two times without doing any further evaluation. So uh, there, are, there are reasons why some of those exotropes you need to worry and evaluate and more so in a in children in whom you cannot explain poor vision as exotropia very rarely gives rise to amblyopia and you should not uh, explain away any poor vision in a child with exotropia. Uh, reverse is true. Poor vision can lead to exotropia, but exotropia leading to poor vision is relatively rare and make that as diagnosis of exclusion and not really the first thing which you think. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Sumita. Indeed, an exhaustive review, and uh, the take home is that exotropia with low vision. I think that is what we need to uh, pay attention to and maybe refer uh, if a general ophthalmologist wants to discuss. Dr. Shubangi, any comment or? Uh... I just wanted to ask Sumita uh, about cases of consecutive exotropia. You have a case of consecutive esotropia. Many you must be having over so many yes. years. Yes, yes. Do you follow them up? What do you find? How do they respond? Or uh, what is the ultimate? Uh, what do you need? How many percentage you need to reoperate? Or a um, lot of them actually do become better over a period of time. Uh, as I said, up to five to ten times, probably you don't need to worry. Especially if child has fairly okay binocular vision prior to surgery, they are, their fusional responses are going to take over. And if there are they have enough fusional potential, most of them will become better. I would be very suspicious of, I would be very wary if it is more than 15 prisms. I would be very wary of even producing a 15 prism in a three-year-old because uh, that, that can actually... Uh, be more harmful than the original large intermittent diagonal. 40 prisms of egg, intermittent exo is probably better than 10 prisms of ESO, constant ESO. Right. So, so, so my question is a bit, this question is a bit can be uh, answered at two levels. Ki yes, older children probably you can watch up to 15 prisms. If it doesn't go away in six weeks, I do move forward with the rest of the steps which I said. I will go give the hypropic correction. I might even add a small prism, which a lot of these times I have I've been able to withdraw the prisms over a period of time because once they start uh, becoming straight over a period of time. But I would be very wary of poor uh, over correction in child who is under five, definitely. Even Thank even you. if it is a small small over correction, I would watch it every two weeks. Thank you, ma'am. I would request Dr. Jitinder uh, to upload his presentation and share. Sir, uh, quickly we can take a comment, which is a little bit behind. Dr. Santan wanted to say something. Yeah, I have one question. How often do you see, you are so concerned about amyopia at the age of three years, uh, in, a, in a child operating for uh, exotropia? How often do you see amyopia developing at the age of five years after isotropia dose. I have seen. That's why I'm talking with personal yes. experience. Yes. Okay. But in the literature, you don't find many cases of amblyopia following exotropia surgery at the age of, say, three so, or between uh, three sir, and I'm, five. Sir, I'm talking about persistent uh, overcorrection. If you were, uh, I don't think we wait for it to amblyopia to develop and then do something about it. We know no. any, any small microtropias if you are going to convert an intermittent divergent squint into a microisotropia, I don't think you are doing a child a favor. Exactly. Because that will be yeah. some binocular vision. Yeah, that is, a un, that is an unsatisfactory outcome. Why should you worry only about the vision? So, somehow I feel that the children less than seven, I would never have a uh, mm -hmm. desire and poor correction at all. I exactly. would rather have an undercorrection and do the second surgery second later on. Surgery later on. Exactly. Less than 7, I would never overcorrect. 7 to 14, maybe overcorrection up to 8 to 10 prisms. More than 10 prisms usually are going to be a problem even for older children even. and adults. Exactly. Thank you, sir. Dr. Jitinder is now ready with his presentation. He will be talking about congenital nystagmus. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sablin. Thank you, uh, Dr. Santosh, sir, for uh, uh, letting me speak on uh, congenital nystagmus, when to refer and uh, what to examine. So uh, we will uh, start with uh, what exactly is uh, nystagmus. Nystagmus, we all know that it is uh, defined as a rhythmic oscillation of eyes. This is just a small video. We all know that the underlying defect basically appears to be a disturbed uh, feedback to the gaze centers from the proprioceptive receptors, which are in the periphery, which interfere with the control of fixation mechanism. The fixation is basically the visual system's ability to detect retinal image drift and program the corrective eye movement. So that is what actually moves the nystagmus also. That is what moves the corrective eye movement is actually the fast phase. We will see how, how it happens. 
and the suppression of these unwanted saccades that would take the eye off the target basically prevents nystagmus in all of us. Uh, the direction, uh, this is what we are, whenever a patient of nystagmus comes, we should see uh, which is the fast phase, whether it is horizontal or vertical fast phase, whether it is pendular or jerk, uh, velocity, amplitude. These are some uh, little bit of uh, signs that we can use. Uh, we can make a grid of uh, nine cases. I'm not going into a lot of details of documentation, but little bit documentation should be done. We should try to look for a null zone. And if, uh, I mean, I, I know there are very, there's very positive, there, there are very few people who have ENG and uh, the slow, slow wave forms, the, the slow phase has to be seen, whether it is accelerating or decelerating, mainly because most of the classification of nystagmus, which is now there, is uh, on the basis of uh, electron nystagmogram. Uh, this is an important point. Uh, we should all, uh, this, this is very important uh, from a uh, life-saving point of view and from uh, the diagnosis point of view. All these points which I have written are basically uh, in the congenital nystagmus, whether it could be the, in good old days, they used to classify it as sensory and motor nystagmus, which has been now taken over by fusion maldevelopment nystagmus and idiopathic or infantile nystagmus syndrome based on electronystagmography. Uh, congenital nystagmus would be more commonly bilateral, more commonly of equal amplitude, predominantly in a single plane, uh, jerky, pendular. There will be a null zone or a neutral zone. There would be a there could be a latent component. It would be absent in sleep. There could be associated head movements. Oscillopsia will be rare and it dampens with convergence. Uh, when, when you see the nystagmus, uh, when you tell the patient to look on the right side, it would start beating on the right. When you tell the patient to look on the left, it will start beating on the left. So all these things are important. Uh, when you have a patient of congenital nystagmus, you have to first differentiate whether it is actually a congenital nystagmus or a pathological or acquired nystagmus, which you have to refer. Uh, now we come to the broad classification. Now the, the, this, the old congenital motor nystagmus is now uh, the infantile nystagmus syndrome. Uh, the clinical features, the nystagmus features, there could be a null zone, it could be jerk, pendular, it could be combined. Most important is that the slow, the slow phase will have an increasing velocity waveform. This is the characteristic differential or differentiating feature between infantile nystagmus syndrome and uh, the fusion mild development nystagmus. Uh, the visual acuity may be very good and the fixation or the expanded nystagmus uh, function may be high. And this is uh, a typical uh, fusion mild development nystagmus. The latent uh, nystagmus is present. So the latent nystagmus is basically, it starts beating on the, toward the fixing eye when one of the eye is covered. The fast phase is uh, toward the side of fixing eye. There is a defect in cortical motion processing which that results from lack of development very early. So if there is a, um, you know, if it is associated with a congenital strabismus, there may be a lack of development of binocular vision and that may uh, relate with the defect in cortical motion processing. And there is an imbalance in subcortical optoconid OKN systems. So this will have an exponentially decreasing velocity waveforms. We will see how to interpret these waveforms uh, uh, very shortly uh, in a brief manner. So these are some of the things which uh, could be seen. There could be a neurologically absolutely normal kid with sensory, visual sensory abnormality. There could be a neurologically and visual sensory normal and still may have nystagmus. The kid may be neurologically abnormal, but there, there would be a static encephalopathy, just like in Joubert syndrome or uh, cortical visual impairment commonly seen in periventricular leukomalacia or hypoxic ischemic damage, like you see the, the ventricles are dilated here or there could be neurologically abnormal with a progressive neurodegenerative disease or a metabolic disease. So this is the whole uh, gamut of uh, nystagmus. Uh, then uh, there is a small uh, subclassification of uh, nystagmus blockage syndrome, which actually shows accelerating slow faces. There will be esotropia without nystagmus on visual attention and orthotropia with nystagmus on visual inattention. This is what I was talking about. Just very briefly, we will see what is electronystagmogram. So this is basically, we, we all know there is a continuous electrical processes in the retina. And this is how, uh, this is how you put the electrodes. And uh, if you look at these are the schematic draw, drawings of the waveforms. So this is the slow phase. This is the fast phase. 
so typically by convention right means up and left means down so you can see that this is the accelerating this is the slow phase the longer line is slow phase and then there is a sudden drip so that when the dip is from up to down it means that it is left beating nystagmus and the slow phase is basically an accelerating slow phase so this is congenital motor nystagmus and likewise we will see so what are the goals of management the the goal of actual management is to increase the visual acuity now you can we can do it with reduction of intensity of nystagmus decreasing the slow phase velocities increasing foveation periods or with abnormal head posture non surgical treatment is not very commonly seen but glasses are the most effective uh, you know intervention that can be given so we have to do a cycloplegic refraction prinzolamide eye drops have been used by deloso and hertel and in some of the patients it does work uh, prisms uh, not very practical but can be used in some patients where uh, you know they are not fit for surgery or they can be used to induce convergence uh, i have not much experience with prisms because i have never uh, really used such large prisms uh, uh, baclofen or carbazepine can reduce nystagmus role of brinzolamide has been seen and in some of the patients you can use that so we come to the major uh, major aspect of management that would be surgical uh, management so first and foremost is before we embark on doing a surgical management we should measure the patient on several visits uh, this is a chrome which is used to measure the head tilt chin elevation and face turn we should recheck the patient several times before uh, we are pretty sure that there is no periodic alternation we should see the patient for both near and distance so this is how we are measuring the face turn chin elevation and uh, the head tilt and so face turns can be of two types they could be conjugate and they could be disconjugate when they are conjugate they could be there could be uh, they, there can be a presence of strabismus or absence of strabismus if there is presence of strabismus with this patient when the patient is looking towards right the eyes are toward the left so the null zone is on the left side uh, straight flush it works for 15 to 20 degrees 5 6 7 8 5 6 7 8 7 and 8 and in presence of strabismus we have to determine the preferred eye for fixation calculate appropriate dosage of surgery on that eye to center the null zone and then calculate appropriate dosage on the fellow eye to center the zone and adjust for the tropia so it is the preferred eye which will be operated for nystagmus and the non preferred eye for the rest of the part which has strabismus now uh, this is this is the same slide and uh, for cncr form of uh, nystagmus or disconjugate we have to do a, a bimedial recession which will center the null zone and also will correct the esotropia so pretty straight forward there if there is a chin up position we have to move both eyes upwards if there is a chin down position we have to uh, move both eyes downwards whether uh, we can do superiorrectus recession of both eyes with inferiorrectus resection or we can uh, use infraoblique this is just a small video of uh, one of the patients which we operated for head tilt uh we can uh, we can even uh, do surgeries for head tilt for head tilt we have to move the eyes towards the null zone so if there is a right head tilt the eyes are moving towards the left so right eye is actually intorting and left eye is extorting so we have to move the eyes we have to to, to uh, tilt the eyes towards the right side so that's uh, this is a patient this was uh, yeah this is the post op and this is the pre op uh, this thing and this is the post op and uh, in summary we have to when when the patient presents to us we have to record the pattern the type the plane we have to do the refraction cyclopedic refraction and we have to document if there is any problem with the fundus evaluation or if the the disc has any abnormality and we have to do a neuroimaging we have to uh, you know differentiate whether it is congenital or pathological glasses and uh, brinzolamide eye drops if there is a face turn appropriate amount of surgery can give good results so thank you so much i hope i was on time that was actually uh, too much on time <laughs> so <laughs> uh, any question from the uh, chairpersons or the panel how frequently do you give brinzolamide drops sir and uh, what is your experience and a follow up uh, with drops like so Uh, for me i i, I give brindamonide eye drops to uh, quite a few patients and i basically what i do is i measure the visual acuity tell them that they can use these drops come back again after 3 weeks 
and if they feel that it is doing something for them because i don't have an electron stigmogram if you have an electron stigmogram it is pretty easy uh, uh, maybe you can pick it up but otherwise uh, i don't think uh, uh, i would continue it for a long time if there is no there is no result i think dr sharma has uh, sir has done some study there was a thesis then at rp center or i think with dr rohit yeah uh so we did this uh, uh, on brinzolamide i would suggest that you should treat a patient for at least 3 months because okay. the effect starts actually significantly after a month patients with face turn face turn surgery is the better intervention uh you could theoretically get a statistically significant improvement in vision in our study but many patients were satisfied some weren't so uh, it's a good try uh, in patients with Uh, nystagmus without a uh, head posture, and uh, a good percentage of them, at least initially for a period of time, do feel satisfied. So we had a few patients who post study also were interested to continue with the drug. Uh, again, on uh, electron nystagmography, we were able to demonstrate that there was an improvement in the waveform. But again, more than the electron nystagmography, it was uh, you know a, a few Cynical. patients were satisfied. some bond so you could give it a try especially in those who don't have a face turn because you really don't have too much to you know offer them i i have myself tried in many patients but i didn't feel there was any response with the brinzolamide so should we continue it for a longer time and see i try try for for a month or so and then if it doesn't so i stop it i think there are some patients who are very you know they come back and they they are seriously into it they at, uh, at least those patients motivate you to continue in other patients also because there, there are some patients who are who you know they really want uh, they they tell that you know there was there is a market improvement i don't know whether it is uh, their uh, psychology which is playing into it or not but because i don't have a electron stigmogram but uh, some patients are really good believers and uh, as dr rohit said he, they, they want to really continue it thank you so much dr jitender uh, we now move on to our next presentation that is a child with progressive myopia which is now a pandemic uh, in, in itself and uh, it's a hot topic for discussion and uh, 15 minutes would be less for that but i am sure dr pradeep will uh, all his experiences to share Uh, sir all yours thank you sablin i would like to thank dr santosh for giving me a topic which otherwise i would not have been speaking on uh, i would have chosen to be speaking on any of the earlier topics i have no financial disclosure except that i have been an expert uh, for the acelor stellist uh, we are talking of myopia as sablin said it's becoming a pandemic the prevalence of myopia varies from various population surveys from 0.8 to 75% there are large racial and ethnic variations which are there and the asian populations particularly the southeast asian and the chinese populations have much more myopia may be associated with increased risk of lot of eye problems which we have to be concerned about now these are the side effects of myopia uh, and they become exponentially more if the power of myopia is increased as we can see in this table the risk of myopic macular degeneration is almost 40 times in minus 6 to minus 9 diopters retinal detachment 21.5 and if it is lessened by let's say by 3 diopters the risk can be reduced by 1/4 or 1/3 and if they can contain it to low myopias then the risk is very uh, negligible or as much as for a normal person so these are the benefits of controlling myopia that we have to be uh, thinking about uh as we can see the reduction of even a one diopter of myopia can be reducing the myopic maculopathy by 40% retinal detachment by 23% and uh, even open angle glaucomas and other problems can be reduced so what are the signs of myopia in a kid they may come with eye strain or headache squeezing their eyes uh, i think this is used in english language as squinting which we nowadays use for another reason the squint would be for us Uh, eye deviation, but they tend to squeeze, uh, squeeze their eyes or make the aperture narrow to see better. Usually, they come closer to the uh, objects. So, if they are not able to see from far away, and especially nowadays, many a times these children are referred by the school teachers that the child could not see from the blackboard uh, from distance. And when they rotate the children in their uh, classroom, they are picked up. They tend to move closer to the TV. 
the disturbing trend is that there is a myopia progression and this uh, all over the world it is rising from in 2020 whatever the levels were there uh, it's gone up almost like double and it may go up to uh, 50% of the global population having myopia what are the causes the factors mainly are ethnicity and the parental history these two things probably we cannot do much about but we can probably change the factors in the optical or the near work activities or time spent outdoors the age of onset is very critical myopia onset at 7 years of age the progression rate is 0 0.90 diopters per year myopia onset at 12 years of age can in, uh, have the progression of 0.3 diopters per year so if we can uh, have the children picked up early, if they have any myopia, we would save them from having a high myopia. According to the COMET study, 50% of children's myopia tends to stabilize by age 15 and 75% by age 18. The role of near work is to be understood. It is very, and that's the reason why it's becoming pandemic uh, in these times when the children are more and more doing a lot of near work and especially the digital screens tend to create more problem because they are more addictive than other near tasks. So how can we control? We can uh, correct the myopia, but remember under correction as it was prevalent in the past years, uh, has found to be having a, a more rapid progression of myopia. So you need to correct them optimally. And still, can we do the management? Yes. So what are the intervention measures that we have been trying for the last few decades? One is the use of spectacle lenses in the form of progressive lenses, bifocals, peripheral defocused lenses in the uh, like dims and the hall lenses, contact lenses have been tried, multifocal extended depth focus dual focus contact lenses as well as orthokeratology and in the pharmaceuticals the low dose atropine has come to our rescue in a big way. Uh, summary of the, uh, the ATOM studies from Singapore uh, show that uh, the this low dose atropine is something which has been very helpful. They started with atropine 1% then 0.5% and now they have come that even 0.01% has found to be having a reduction in myopia progression to an extent of about 0.7% one diopter in a, uh, two years. This is a summary of these two studies, uh, which are landmark studies, the ATOM1 and ATOM2, which have shown consistently that low dose atropine of 0.01% even is effective in controlling the myopia progression. Similarly, the LAMP study, the low concentration atropine for myopia progression done at Hong Kong has also confirmed these findings, although they have suggested that 0.05% atropine is the more optimal concentration to be used. Um, even from India, a study done, um, a multicentric trial published by Dr. Rohit Saxena has shown that in a year's time, a 54% reduction in the uh, spherical error progression was seen with even 0.01%. Similarly, an Australian study, the West Australia study, ATOM study, has also confirmed these findings. Uh, the uh, PEDDIG study from US somehow has not confirmed these. And the reason given by Michael Repka is that it could be a variation of the ethnic population that they had chosen in this uh, group. They were less Asian and more African-American who have otherwise also less progression. The mechanism of action for low dose atropine is non-accommodative. It is not by uh, having a cycloplegic effect, but we do not know for sure what and how it works, but it is seemingly working probably through a neurochemical cascade uh, on the non-muscarinic M1, M4 receptors at the retina, or maybe directly on the scleral fibroblasts. And it may be through a dopamine release, which has been found to be uh, there. And as we can see that outdoor activity has more dopamine, uh, which is probably the way it works. This could be uh, another way of substantiating this uh, hypothesis. The meta-analysis have shown that AL elongation was significantly lower, even with 0.01% atropine. And although 0.05% was comparable uh, with the higher doses of atropine, the pupil size and accommodation amplitude were dose related more so with 0 0.05 than with the 0.01 person. The other means of uh, controlling myopia is optimizing the optical correction of myopia. As we know that the way we need we treat myopia, usually with the spectacles, it has a, a peripheral hyperopic focus. But the reverse has been shown in animals to be having a peripheral myopic defocus to be controlling myopia progression. In the award-winning lecture by Dr. Earl Smith III, this has been shown and published. The special spectacles, uh, we are talking of now uh, special designs. One is the defocus incorporated multiple segments by uh, as known in short as DIMPS. 
Now, this is 1.03 millimeter diameter lens slits, which are sparing the central nine millimeters, and they are in a honeycomb appearance in, in the 33 millimeters. Similarly, there is a HAL or the highly aspherical lens slit target technology, which creates a volume of myopic defocus or a white shell in front of the retina by 11 concentric rings. If you see comparison of these two, these two mechanisms are having aspherical lens slits in uh, concentric configuration and the other one is in the honeycomb uh, configuration. The DIM study of two year results showed that 52% less spherical uh, uh, error equivalent was seen uh, to be reduced and uh, AL elongation, the axial length elongation by 62% with the DIMS lenses. Similarly, the HALT published the 24 month or two year clinical trial in, in which they had shown 67% efficacy in the spherical error uh, in diopters and 60% in terms of axial length by the usage of these uh, uh, spectacles which have been worn at least 12 hours per day. The study has been uh, now extended to three years and the extent uh, these 36 months trial results are now available and they further substantiate that the myopia progression has been reduced by 1.06 diopters in three years time and similarly the axial length has been also changed by 0.49 millimeters compared to the single vision lenses. So these are the comparison of the spectacle lenses. Uh, as you can see, the earlier use progressive additional lenses or bifocals were not much of uh, much help, but there has been a significant effect by either the DIMS or the highly aspherical lens lit technology. What are the adverse effects of these visual functions? Uh, we can see that there is a contrast equity effect and also a, a peripheral motion perception, which have been studied. Fortunately, they are not much affected in the peripheral uh, vision of these children. Uh, the effect on binocular functions is another thing that we need to be uh, aware of in children. And we know that there is a uh, reduction in accommodation. So by spectacles and the contact lenses, there is an exophoric shift. Whereas using cycloplegic drops, uh, even like 0.05% can have an esophoric shift. So be uh, aware of this. Uh, the summary of this is that we do have these things available. So what do we do? So we have the myopia control strategies available in the form of either spectacles or uh, orthokeratology, which has its own problems, and the atropine in the form of 0 0.05. But in India, we have only a 0.01% uh, atropine available. So what do we do? We emphasize, first of all, the daylight outdoor activity in any child having myopia. Uh, we need to emphasize that a minimum of two hours per day or 14 hours a week is found to be effective in at least delaying the uh, myopia even if not having an uh, effect on progress, uh, the control of progressive myopia. Reduce sustained near activities is very important. The 20-20-20 rule is empirically used, but studies have shown that 30 minutes, giving a break after 30 minutes of at least one or two minutes is found to be having a better effect uh, and sustained near activity should be curtailed. Uh, we should talk to these uh, parents if the myopia is progressive. So, and then also emphasize the need of compliance whenever whatever measure we are going to use. We may you choose one or more if the uh, risk is more and the refraction should always be done under cycloplegia. What are the risk factors? We do use this sheet usually uh, for the uh, explaining to the uh, uh, parents. First of all, the factors we need to understand the current age. If the child is of um, younger age, the risk is higher as we had talked about earlier. If both parents are myopic, again, the risk is higher. If the time spent outdoors is less than 1.5 hours, again, the risk is going to be more. If the near works time spent is more, it's uh, than three hours, again, the risk is more. If the refractive error at the uh, presentation time, the uh, first time that we are seeing is going to be um, there at six, seven years of age. So younger people uh, and they are having a higher pro progression of myopia. Contrast this with the lower risk with the other children. So if we have these children having a risk of higher myopia, we need to first document progression. Never start atropine treatment or a spectacles in a child just having myopia unless you have documented in at least a six month progression has been seen because I feel otherwise we would be getting credit for the medicines which otherwise would not have been progressing otherwise on its own. Special attention to younger children with high myopia and other risk factors such as family history or uh, pathological myopia should be taken into account. If there is a higher risk, then higher dosage could be considered at the beginning of the treatment. The good thing is that children can tolerate higher doses better than older children. 
and because their amplitude for accommodation is higher. So these children, even with 0.05% would be having less of problems uh, compared to the adults who may have uh, better off with the 0.01%. Uh, we should also tell the uh, parents about non-responders. It's important that we uh, tell them about the compliance. I usually tell them the analogy of guarding the uh, border. If you uh, guard it 23 hours but sleep in one hour, you would lose the effect altogether. So we need to be very diligent in using either the atropine or the glasses which have been recommended to be used in 12 hours per day. When we are going to stop, we should be tapering and never stop the medicine abruptly because we know that there is a rebound effect. And we should taper it by using a lesser concentration or later on by using less days in a week. Uh, recently, I have come across that there are now newer mechanisms in children, particularly because putting a drop is a challenge. So these uh, optijet or a mi uh, micropine thing is a dispenser, which would be probably available in future. They inject micro doses and they are uh, even going to be uh, nicely uh, taken up by the children. There is a nice uh, prevention management children progressive myopia national consensus guidelines published in IGO. Uh, you can go into for more details. So that would be my uh, uh, talk on this uh, for uh, this purpose, we can have discussion if there are any points. Thank you, Dr. Sabli. Thank you so much, sir. It was indeed an exhaustive review of uh, all treatment modalities that we have, uh, stressing on the fact that pharmacotherapy is that presents the most uh, agreed to upon modality to for myopia progression. And we have atropine 0.01 that is commercially available. Uh, any comments by um, the panel, Dr. Pandey, Dr. Elizabeth? See, there, yeah. uh, am, am I audible now? Yes, yes ma'am, you are. Yeah. So, so that was an <clears throat> that was an exhaustive presentation <clears throat> on prevention of progression of myopia. Uh, I fully agree with uh, everything. Uh, one thing I would like to add is that by preventing the progression, we are giving them a chance for LASIK surgery. That also is also important. Uh, we are preventing. <laughs> <laughs> preventing the complication but you know as the child grows up you know if the uh, myopia is controlled they can go ahead for a LASIK that also is important <laughs> yeah. uh, better point of view we now yeah. have Dr. Subhash Tadya he would be talking about a child with amblyopia and Dr. Subhash sir is director professor at department of ophthalmology Guru Nanak Eye Center Dr. Subhash sir please Uh, Sorry, my slides are visible. I can see your slides, sir. Yes. Yes, yes. So, very good evening to one and all. Uh, at the outset, <coughs> I like to thank AIUS and particularly Dr. Santos for uh, inviting me to speak. And I would also like to thank all the panelists. I will be speaking on uh, how to diagnose and manage and when to refer a child with amblyopia. So, basically, first step is what is amlyopia. So amlyopia is derived from Greek word, which means dull vision. And clinically, it is defined as unilateral or bilateral reduction in best corrected central visual acuity, which is caused by foam vision deprivation and are abnormal binocular inflection during critical period of visual development without any visible organic cause. The visual acuity should be less than 612 for bilateral amblyopia, and there should be difference of two or more lines for unilateral amblyopia. And it is correctable if appropriate measures are applied at appropriate time. Basically, in pathophysiology, development of various visual functions depends on three fundamental conditions. First, adequate stimulus from each eye. Secondly, corresponding retinal images. And thirdly, integrity of visual pathway. Many neurological, physiological, and psychological aspects of amblyopia are still not fully understood. What are the main alterations in amblyopia? There is deprivation of visual stimuli, that is due to doses, tetract, or nystagmus, alteration of sharpness of visual stimuli with infective changes, that is high ametropia or an isometropia, and non corresponding images received by each eye, that is due to starvation. So, why amblyopia should be treated? because it leads to restricted career options, reduced quality of life, less social contact, cosmetic distress, low self-esteem, low self-esteem, visual disorientation, and fear of loss of vision in other eyes. 
So what are the clues for myopia? It is a significant health problem. Early detection is critical for success. Fix if a child is having fixation preference, there is tilting of head, rubbing of eyes, abnormally high blink rate, resistance for occlusion of the sound eye, drifting of eye when child is tired and sick, closure of one eye in sunlight, and child is looking uh, close to uh, very uh, closely. And if there is presence of amblyogenic factors, then we must <coughs> look for and uh, rule out amblyopia in these uh, patients. Then who are the patients who are at risk? Unilateral amblyopia is associated with strabismus and more in isotropes as compared to isotropes. If there is high refractive error, if hypermetropia is of more than 3.5 diopter, astigmatism of more than 1.5 diopter, you must suspect amblyopia. If there is presence of microtopia and small angle isodeviations are there, you must rule out amblyopia. Presence of unilateral cataract, congenital cataract, ptosis or other media opacities, they have high amblyogenic tendencies, bilateral cataracts with opacities. If there is family history of amblyopia and squint, if there is premature baby, is, and if there is delayed neurological and visual maturation of unclear etiology, these are the patients who are at risk for development of amblyopia. In amblyopia, we must note down the age of onset, interval between onset and presentation, history of prior treatment, Education and motivation of the parents is the most important factor. Visual equity, reflection, glass prescription, fundus examination, fixation preference, and presence of mistakes. However, it is not uncommon to see getting clinicians puzzled over a case of diminution of vision, whether it is functional, amblyopia, or otherwise. And for diagnosis of amblyopia, there must be reduction of the visual equity there must be presence of amblyogenic factors and there should not be any organic cause for reduction of visual acuity. Until and unless these three conditions are there, you should not label a patient as amblyopic and carry home message is complete ocular examination is mandatory before a patient is labeled as amblyopic. What are the various clinical features? Decrease in the visual acuity is the hallmark for amblyopia. If there is defective stereo acuity, it necessitates further investigation for amblyopia. Fixation preference for one eye suggests amblyopia in preverbal children, and it remains one of the most valuable clinical method for diagnosis of amblyopia. Crowding phenomena is uh, very important in cases of amblyopia. The effect of neutral density filters, the vision might improve in amblyopic eye with neutral density filters, usually in <coughs> Dense amblyopia, color vision defects might be seen. Contrast sensitivity is defective. Visual fields are also lost. There is reduced reading speed of the child. There is compromised fine motor skills. Accommodation may be defective. RAPD is occasionally present. And eccentric fixation is present in many patients. And macular thickness may be affected on OCT. And functional MRI can detect cortical defects in amblyopia. However, amblyopia remains one of the most confused entity in ophthalmology. We have to test the visual equity on age appropriate basis, that is for infants, preferential looking VEP, OKN, and for pre verbal children, preferential looking VEP, picture charts, Landor, C chart, Teller acuity card, and older children, Sennel charts. So, for diagnosis of amblyopia in pre verbal children, fixation preference is one of the most important. Thing and grating equity can be determined using Taylor equity cards. However, uh, these have drawbacks. They are time consuming, require expertise, and underestimate some myopia. Bruckner's reflex is very important and it is done using the direct ophthalmoscope and it is simple and useful uh, to diagnose ametropia and anomalies of eye at an early age. Then you must <coughs> see is child looking well, developmentally normal, any structural defect, any head postures. Then what are the visual goals to be achieved? Identify the children at risk, diagnose the myopia at the earliest, identify the etiology of myopia, inform the family about the disease, start the treatment at earliest, limit the effect of myopia on quality of life, employment, and career options, re-evaluate the patient and revise treatment as and when necessary. It is our duty to diagnose myopia at the earliest so that treatment can be started. Then what are the questions that need to be answered? What are the prerequisites patients at risk, need for refractive correction, when to start amblyopia therapy, amblyopia th 
थेरेपी आर सर्जरी ट्रीटमेंट ऑप्शन अवेलेबल पैचिंग आर पिनलाइजेशन रोल ऑफ मेडिकल मैनेजमेंट कंप्लायस रोल ऑफ नियर एक्सरसाइजेज विद ऑक्लूजन एंड इफेक्टिव सर्जरी सो बेसिक स्ट्रेटजी इन अम्बलायोपिया इज यू हैव टू प्रेजेंट ए क्लियर रेटनल इमेज टू द अम्बलायोपिक आई by eliminating causes of visual deprivation and correcting visually significant refractive error secondly you have to make the patient to use the amlyopic eye and you have to observe uh, the patient for any recurrence full cytoplasmic refractive correction patching pinlization pharmacological therapy refractive surgery near visual activities in the form of television and mobile games binocular treatment and smart glasses are some of the treatment modalities classical treatment is refractive correction patching pinlization and near activities and majority of the patients they will respond to this treatment for non compliant and non responders uh, to the traditional amlyopia uh, treatment alternative therapies are there like vision therapy binocular therapy but there are in insufficient evidences to recommend them pharmacological adjuvant to the standard treatment although a large magnitude of studies have been done but none of them is full proof when to start amlyopia therapy start at the earliest early detection and treatment are highly cost effective which comes first amlyopia or surgery classical <coughs> teaching is treatment of amlyopia should be done prior to surgical intervention defective correction is the most important step in uh, treatment of amlyopia and child's prescription need to be accurate to begin with has to be changed according to the refractive status because inadequate refractive correction reduces the treatment efficacy so proper cytoplasmic refraction is must as have been found in ats5 and ats7 and ats5 was uh, done to evaluate effectiveness of refractive correction in moderate amlyopia and they concluded amlyopia resolved in 27% of the patients and improvement of more than two line was seen in 77% patients with refractive correction only potentially amlyogenic refractive error has to be <coughs> kept in mind then another question is patching or pinlization it was uh, studied in ats1 and they concluded both are appropriate treatment modality for treatment of moderate amlyopia there is no shortcut or substitute for occlusion in amlyopia therapy however variability exists number of course prescribed to treat amlyopic patients then there are various considerations in patching type of occluder how many hours schedule follow up what to look for how long and when to stop constant total occlusion of the sound eye is the most effective method because it forces the patient to use amlyopic eye it also inhibits inhibitory impulses arising from the sound eye and it is best instituted in infancy but with <laughs> these pedic group uh, studies there are uh, 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 there is choice of uh, part time occlusion also there are various occlusion schedules which have been described follow up schedule is one week for each year of age you have to encourage the child for near exercises and recording of the visual acuity of both eyes with same chart and under similar physical conditions has to be done give the child 5 to 10 minutes <coughs> for acclimatization and not for by uh, nocular fixation pattern we have to see whether there is any improvement or worsening of the vision if there is any change of vision uh, change of the pattern and end point of the therapy is free alteration and equalization of vision and if there is no improvement in vision after 3 to 6 month of uh, Uh, <clears throat> proper occlusion occlusion failure is defined as if there is no improvement for at least three follow up visits after full time occlusion how to maintain the visual acuity after occlusion you adopt any of the following part time occlusion or reduce the visual acuity by atopic pinlization ats 15 has been <clears throat> done regarding randomized style of increasing touches of amlyopia and there is more improvement in visual acuity after 10 weeks compared with two hours daily patching surgery should be preferably done within 6 month of amlyopia treatment these are various disadvantages of occlusion like occlusion amlyopia functional debilitation cosmetic blemish occlusion amlyopia it signifies good potential in amlyopic eye it is cosmetic blemish in severe amlyopia especially early in the treatment it is significant deterrent to good compliance one fourth of the successfully treated amlyopic patients they experience a recurrence within first year of the treatment carry home message is don't stop the occlusion therapy abruptly compliance is a very important factor for occlusion treatment however monitoring the compliance is a tedious job allergic skin reactions can be minimized with use of skin uh, <coughs> creams psychological problems are there but good parental counseling is needed of our prognostic <coughs> various prognostic considerations are uh, there and good prognostic factors are younger age good pre treatment visual acuity myopic refractive error additional ear exercises good compliance and absence of action fixation 
Penalization is indicated in moderate amblyopia in uncooperative patients and isometopic amblyopia as a maintenance therapy, occlusion failure, allergy to patch and complications of the patch, non-compliant patients and latent nystagmus with starvismic amblyopia. There is no uh, risk of occlusion amblyopia. It is better tolerated uh, because of comfort and cosmesis. Major disadvantage is potential side effect due to systemic absorption of the drugs. Penalization and uh, occlusion, they have been found to be appropriate modality for initial treatment of amlyopia in cases of uh, uh, pedic uh, group of the studies. Daily and weekend atropine has been tried in ATS4. Then <laughs> this perception learning dioptic training has also been tried, but uh, they, most of these studies, they are lab-based and uh, does not find uh, much of the uh, uh, literature on these. Medical treatment, levodopa is a, was supposed to be a promising agent in augmenting the conventional occlusion only, and it is not a primary line of therapy. Various side effects have been found, and in ATS 14, it was not found to be of much use. Near exercises are often prescribed during patching from lipia based on assumptions that those activities they stimulate the visual system. In ATS 6, uh, performing common near activities was found not to improve visual outcome and treatment of amlyopia. However, there are a lot of other studies which are contrary to recommendation of ATS-6 and we routinely recommend near visual activities in the treatment of amlyopia with the patching. Then a novel and interesting manner is to associate amlyopia therapy with television game. We have done a study regarding role of television games in amlyopia and published in uh, Journal of Starvismus. And uh, in our study, though ours was a small pilot study, based on our results, we recommend use of near activities in the form of television games along with full-time occlusion and treatment of amlyopia. This, uh, and I, in adult and isometropic amlyops, <laughs> LASIK has been found to be successful in uh, some patients, but in children, uh, the role is controversial. Mobile games are very popular. They are available in every household. They are a popular mode of entertainment. And now recent concept is loss of binocularity is one of the defining features of homolipia. So now focus is shifted from monocular interventions to intervention that directly target binocular functions. This has led to increased interest in development of homolipia treatment that directly address the binocular dysfunction by promoting binocular vision and reducing the inability interactions within the visual cortex and mobile games as a form of near visual activity. They are useful in treatment of homolipia. Hess et al. has found them to be useful and basically mobile games, they strengthen the fusion and reduce the suppression. So we have also done a thesis and we recommend a mobile game uh, exercises as a form of near visual activities along with <coughs> two hours occlusion in uh, uh, mild amlyopia. Video games have been also tried, but they have not been uh, found to be of much use in ATS-18. Smart glasses testing is the most effective treatment, but has undesirable side effects. The smart glasses have advantage. They are ultra safe, proven efficacy in built frame pr of prescription. They are most advanced glasses for programmed intermittent occlusion, but uh, uh, post sector uh, is a limiting factor. Amlyopia um, with eccentric fixation, role of inverse occlusion is found to be useful. We have uh, found it to be useful in uh, study done at our center, amlyopia um, with nystagmus, atropine, penalization has to be done. Unilateral aphakic infants, most researchers seem to favor occluding not more than 50% of the time. And when to refer, the pediatrician should look for attack inability to fixate and any ocular deviation and abnormal eye movements. Such patients should be referred immediately to the ophthalmologist. Other uh, patients which require referral are vegetable amlyopia, occlusion failure, cases with high refractive error, and patients requiring advanced treatment uh, in the form of <laughs> squint surgery and uh, refractive surgery. Why there is lack of desired uh, response in amlyopia if treatment has started late, late lack of compliance and other associated <clears throat> So then I would like to I would like to conclude optical correction alone is successful in improving the amlyopia in nearly one third of the patient. Patching is the most effective treatment. Two hours patching for moderate amlyopia and six hours patching for severe amlyopia. And patching should be prescribed along with near visual activities. Abrupt stopping of patching has high risk of 
recurrence atropine penalization is as effective as patching treatment is most effective up to 7 year of age and near activities in the form of television and mobile games are beneficial smart glasses are areas of future research thank you thank you so much sir for that elaborate presentation on amlyopri and all the treatment modalities available we have a question on the youtube chat so that uh, i would like to request you to answer that uh, which guidelines do we follow for spectacle prescription in children do we follow the american guidelines or the indian ones uh, guidelines aius guidelines are there spousy guidelines are there yes. so we do have uh, guidelines by the aius and we have published guidelines in the indian journal of ophthalmology which i think yeah. is the most commonly followed guidelines uh, that, uh, by us we also have a question dr pradeep sir uh, there is a question that how long would we continue 0.01% atropine for okay so when we are starting at what age that is important right now we have studies done from singapore they are even using in older than 12 years they have used till about 15 years of age this uh, has been used so that is not a issue uh, at one time there was a concern that maybe we are if you are continuing for long there would be some side effects fortunately that is not being seen so with the 0.01% but yes what we are going to do is like if we are starting young let's say the child is 5 years old and you want to start you may have to continue and see you may taper down once you have been able to get a control in 2 years time then you can taper down the dose if you are using a higher dose of let's say 0.05 you can come down to 0.01% and then use it for a year and then you can gradually taper if it's maintained with that in a probably 2 3 years time probably you can uh, stop it also depending on the progression rate of the children some children i have seen in spite of using a 0.01% they are not responding we have in those cases since we don't have a 0.05% what i have used is a 10 minute gap and twice in the night time i do not prefer to use morning and evening doses because of the possibility of some side effect in the day time so i would rather put it in the night time with a gap of 10 minutes so that there is a little double dosing it may not be as good as 0.05 and we are asking the pharmaceutical companies to get in 0.05% available in india so those children who are not responding to 0.01 the way to move forward would be 0.05% second option is to use glasses along with the uh, atropine both are supposed to be working in tandem so it's not that they are mutually exclusive so you can add both so in severe um, myopes or a high risk let's say both parents are myopic and they are already having let's say my, uh, five diopters of myopia at that uh, early age then i would probably say that okay you can use spectacles as well as the uh, drops and the concentration you can then see whether the minimum you can uh, start with and you can see if it's not working you can go with a higher concentration oh, thank you sir So, Rohit sir, what is your uh, opinion on combination treatment modalities for uh, myopia? Uh, so, uh, wherever the studies have been done, they've shown the effect to be additive, as uh, pointed out. Point oh five uh, multicentric uh, double-blinded trial is ongoing. So, we hope that uh, by January, this uh, study should be out with results, and that would that is being done for regulatory purposes. So, if it comes. Uh, positive then we hope that by another 6 months after that we should be looking for the availability of the drug in the market our experience with 0.05 has been fairly good uh, we've tried them on patients uh, dispensing it from our pharmacy we tried them in patients with uh, who were non responsive or poor responders to 0.01 so uh, currently my modality is that if it is non responsive or poor responsive i'll shift from 0.01 to 0.05 and uh, however if the effect is very poor to start off with then probably discuss with the patients about shifting to an optical i would say that in the first go we should see the effect of an individual intervention before we think in terms of a combination because uh, if one is not working there is no point in continuing with that intervention for too long and obviously we know that almost up to 30% of children may not be well controlled on 0.01 so 30% may have 0.05 diopters of progression despite being on treatment so as sir is as sir gave i think a wonderful uh, approach to my idea i think documenting progression uh, before you start therapy is not only important because you need to treat the disease you need to diagnose that there is progressive myopia and treat that and not just myopia 
the other important thing as sir has pointed out is the how much is the impact of your intervention so once you've started on a therapy uh, and you know that the child was progressing say 0.75 diopters per year and your impact has come down is 0.5 uh, diopters per year now you know that you have some modest impact so if it was on low dose 0.01 i would shift him to 0.05 so it's important for us to assess the response to therapy by knowing what the baseline progression was so and yes combination as i said has been shown to do well in uh, uh, studies that have been done using combination we have also in our non responders seen but i mean obviously results are yet to be out uh, for an indian combination study we found that you know anterior segment uh, reduction of uh, myopia is also there because of low dose atropine and therefore the results of atropine low dose atropine need to be taken with a little bit of you know pinch of salt and that's probably why there was this initial uh, in concordance between the refractive error reduction in rate and the axial length reduction in rate so so it's very very important for us to know how much the child was progressing and the impact of atropine what you did thank you so again uh, reiterating the importance of documenting progression even once you have started a treatment modality another question dr jitender if you there with us uh, somebody has asked about congenital nystagmus and amblyopia and a uh, role of fardin in some cases uh, <clears throat> i didn't get the question what is the role of fardin in uh, nystagmus yeah, i think it so they have said so, congenital yeah, nystagmus can, and amblyopia yeah you can you can do fardin but uh, the whole uh, problem is that you know there is a problem with the biofeedback so doing fardin would reduce the amplitude for some time but i i have not done uh, uh, i think it's, yeah, internet is unstable so, so we have a question yeah tried by people but it is not really <laughs> effective in the long run <laughs> yeah yeah it's not a very effective treatment Uh, but, another uh, question. Yeah, please go ahead. I'm so sorry. The point there, Sablin. Can I just answer the point? Yes, sir. About sir. Please, sir. Please, 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 sir. You you don't do fardin for treating amblyopia. You do fardin for treating probably mm -hmm. esophagus. That's what he means. We no. The we, question was for nystagmus. Nystagmus. Unless they're asking for Chiancia syndrome, uh, where you have esotropia along with nystagmus, where pardon uh, is indicated along with mri session but otherwise as sir has said that uh, nystagmus uh, not effective pardons are not effective all four horizontal recti pardons have been described but essentially not effective they are only temporary measures just like the uh, supra maximal recessions which would be like equivalent to pardon in a way they would be reducing so, the amplitude of nystagmus in the horizontal nystagmus if we do all the four horizontal recti supra maximal recessions so studies done have shown that the effect in those also is only about 3 months after 3 months the nystagmography shows the same as it was pre op the same is true with the hertel deloso procedures which uh, we had seen in rp center that the effect is only short lived just 3 months so really we do not have any clear uh, uh, evidence for these two technologies thank you sir uh, sumita ma'am there is a question that exotropia with hyperopia do we give a refractive correction and how long do we follow up before going in for surgery deciding for surgery we can't I hear you actually unmute yourself unmute yeah. yeah so mm -hmm. hyperopia technically um, would uh, relax your accommodation and convergence and exotropia should should become more but if it is a high hyperopia so up to 2 to 2.5 diopter probably you can ignore hyperopia you need not give prescription but anything above 2 is causes visual blur and that blur itself will cause your uh, exotropia to exactly. deteriorate i'm talking about intermittent so anything above 2.5 probably needs to be prescribed again you have to consider the age of the patient here in a toddler probably you can ignore a little bit more in a school going child or a teenager you may have to give uh, less than that but it definitely if anything which is above 2.5 to 3 again depending on the age of the child you probably better to prescribe because it does 
clearing the visual blur helps in controlling the strabismus also better. Now, second question is about amblyopia with exotropia. Uh, is that more, uh, what uh, is in these question? cases only when do you would like to operate? That's the question. Like the question with the exo with the yeah, with hyperopia. Yeah. Yeah. So I think guidelines are same irrespective of. Uh, I think uh, the question hyperopia. comes. Yeah, if your angles are a little bit more, please remeasure the squints uh, with the. If your uh, hyperopia is say seven, eight, or more, or uh, then probably your prismatic error, which is induced by glasses, so it probably is preferable to remeasure those children with a contact lens, <clears throat> and uh, accordingly you do because plus powers do underestimate a little bit of angles. So that's the only difference as far as the surgical plan is concerned, hyperopia or myopia or no error. But apart from that, guidelines remain same. It is not really related to the refractive error. But yes, if you have very high myopia, very high hyperopia, it does uh, changes your angles measurements a bit. So it's always good to remeasure your angles with contact lens or use a table. Yeah. And so there are some very table. effective tables which are mm -hmm. uh, given to convert for the vertex distance. So I think for both high that, myopia and for and high hyperopia. Hyperopia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that rule remains same. If anything is more than five diopters, probably you need to so again, minus measures more and minus measures more and, measures more and uh, hyperopia measures less. less. So, uh, so small, uh, small the, amount of hypermetropia, small to moderate amount of hypermetropia generally masks the exotropia. So, yeah. especially the intermittent exotropia. So, if we have to uh, plan and surgery, I prefer to give them correction, uh, full correction with their spectacles so as to unmask how much uh, ever uh, divergence they have. Oh, okay. So, for us to assess uh, the deviation properly before surgery. Correct. In and addition, so let's not forget that astigmatism may be there. So, it, if it's a plus astigmatism, it will be equally harmful. So, uh, I mean, you need to correct it. So, uh, you may think it's a hyperopic astigmatism. That's not going to be helping the child in uh, accommodating and uh, making it better. So, if there is an astigmatism, you need to correct it, even if it's yeah. like one diopter or 1.5 diopter. Yeah, astigmatism is full correction, irrespective of what. And, and whenever you're undercorrecting, the key thing is that the vision should not drop. So, you undercorrect to the maximum or whatever you feel is tolerable. But the vision should not drop, otherwise your you know fusional virgins gets affected. So mild undercorrections or mild uh, hyperopias, you code off the glasses. But again, uh, without the glasses, check the vision. Just make sure that the vision is not dropping, otherwise you kind of lost uh, you know lost one fusional lost the fusional virgins to try and gain accommodative virgins. So. In some of the cases, this uh, pre-op prism adaptation test might be useful. How much importance uh, you would give for assessing intermittent divergent screen for distance stereopsis? See, initially what happens is intermittent divergent screen, it is the distance stereopsis which is affected. And gradually as the eye diverges more and more, the near stereopsis also gets affected. We don't check the distance stereopsis always. And probably we don't check the near stereopsis either. Uh, Which is wrong. That should be done. <laughs> At least that should be done. Near should. And uh, but, this the equipments for distance stereopsis are not available at uh, to. Agreed. Maturity. So the near so, stereopsis should never be missed. I would say whenever even yes. a child three plus, uh, we are able to do a TNO test. So any child is going to be cooperative, and you can do uh, the stereopsis testing for near. Whenever you feel that the near stereopsis has become, it should not be delayed for surgery. So you may be deferring the surgery sometimes because the mother is saying that more than 50% time is fusing. But if you find the stereopsis for near is deteriorating, it is a red flag. And you need to tell that, yes, this is, we should do it. Yeah, at some stage, near, near, near stereopsis is not a very good indicator of control as far as because it it is really retained for a very long time, even though control no, no, is... No, but I see cases which are having poorer near stereopsis also. Okay. So we are getting cases which are deferred yeah. and many a times there. Uh, the other thing which I find is that there are people who recommend alternate occlusion. 
somehow I have not been a big fan of that unless there is associated amblyopia. If there is amblyopia associated, yes, treat the amblyopia by occlusion. Uh, but otherwise, in intermittent divergent squint, giving an alternate occlusion to my mind appears counterintuitive that you are breaking the fusion for whatever hours you are using. Why do you want to do it? I would say that don't use this. Unless you have an evidence of cent of a small central scotoma during the time the patient is divergent or, I mean, if there is near stereopsis. There is an amblyopia, yes. If yeah, there is I mean, any exactly. poor vision, then you are justified in doing occlusion for the reason for amblyopia, not for idea. stereopsis, then obviously the patient is, when he's fused, he is having binocularity. As far as saying, why would you want that to be lost? Why would you reduce the duration of the I would rather time? encourage them to do fusion. Yeah. And even small children, you can give convergence training, if not convergence exercises on machines, they, they, they can be asked to converge closer. That is something which can be, if you are waiting for four years or five years, in the meantime, you can do that. Although a recent study is so They will be very happy to watch mobile. <laughs> basically, all these uh, non-surgical modalities, they are temporary measures. <laughs> So I was uh, alternate patching. I I would say it probably has a small role in sometimes mm -hmm. children who are one and a half years mm -hmm. those who are one one and a half years old very yeah. difficult to measure where you have to stand six feet apart to say yes yeah, squint is there that kind of things probably if parents. I think but, it has some placebo effect on the. But but why would you want to alternate patch such a child whom you cannot even you know no, confirm I, that I, you're going to have I any benefit or side effects? I can see the, I can see the squint. No, why I'm patch? Not letting yeah, patch I, I mean, you can't so have an ostrich yeah, attitude yeah. of hiding the squint. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, no. patch to make sure that he breaks and uh, he comes back no, no. later, but definitely I somehow I think it's counterintuitive. It doesn't. But I don't have any measurements. What do I do? Uh, no, uh, wait for that time that you can have measurement in the yeah, so in, in don't that patch. Time, don't make it time, worse. If you do alternate patching, sometimes parents feel yes, something is being done. Doctor is on no, top no, no. of it. But that is, I think, I, I would, to my mind, it appears uh, the obverse of what one should do. <laughs> so, Most so are uh, equivocal in their outcome. Even in older children, the studies that have compared patch versus no patch, they have shown it to be equivocal. I mean, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, any uh, you know definitive advantage in Correct. older children where you can assess so in Correct. younger children i would be a little careful in you know advising anything as that, you know just follow up in, uh, see in, uh, i have a point in yes. infantile uh, no intermittent exotropia sometimes one eye will be squinting more patients will complain yeah, that, that, that one eye is squinting more uh, yeah and then uh, it may be very difficult for us to assess the vision. The child will be too small. The assessment of vision also may not be very accurate. In that case, sometimes uh, alternate occlusion we can give for a short time. That's what uh, I do in, in a very small child. If yeah, you're suspecting okay. amblyopia, it is fine. Yeah, if yeah, there is a preference. Amblyopia. Yeah, sir is already saying Thank if you, there is a clear fixation preference, you probably should uh, occlude the dotted it. tie only. Don't make it worse. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in infantile ET, infantile ET, we we give alternate occlusion. No? Ah, infantile ET. esotropia is of course totally different boys yeah. must, and they are yeah. constant esotropes. So there is nothing that we can help them by making them fuse. So infantile esotropia is of course alternate occlusion till the time we operate, maybe a month. Thank, Thank you so much, much. Uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Solim. Can I leave? I have to go somewhere. So thank Quality you so much. Quantity. We have a lot of uh, congratulatory messages on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, and I would uh, thank everyone for their presentation today. Dr. Manoj, uh, I would hand over him for a small vote of thanks. Thank you. It has been a very uh, sort of a enriching experience for me as a comprehensive ophthalmologist to be present and uh, hearing you all speak about the pediatrics of speciality. So on behalf of AIOS headquarters, it is my present uh, privilege to propose a vote of thanks. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma sir for chairing this session. And uh, my congenial thanks to Dr. Savleen for being the expert moderator today. And uh, we had a galaxy of speakers today, right from Dr. Ramesh Kekunaya, Dr. Ankita Bisani, Dr. The, the Sumita Agarkar, Dr. Jitendra Jethani, Dr. Pradeep Parmasar himself, and Dr. Subhash Dadeya. 
And my congenial thanks also to the expert panel, Dr. Santhan Gopal, Dr. Pramod Kumar Pandey, Dr. Shubhangi Bhave, Dr. Elizabeth Joseph, and last but not the least, Dr. Rohit Saxena. So thank you all for this wonderful session on pediatric orthopedics.